15, and we're starting at 1 o'clock. Um, today we have a presentation by the Sewer uh, University. It should be very interesting. It will take the uh, whole two hours, not the presentation, but us asking questions and learning about this. So I'd like to uh, call to order this meeting. Can we have the roll call, Chrissy? Calling the roll, Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Ms. Brown? Ms. Brown is absent. Mr. Miller? Here. We have a quorum. Clerk, is there any public comment related to the agenda? No, Madam Chair. No one has signed in. All right. If someone could make a motion to approve the minutes from the May 16th meeting. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Minutes have been approved. Um, like I stated, no matters were referred to the committee. Um, and if we hadn't been so uh, advanced in presentations, we probably wouldn't have had this due to the holiday, but we had scheduled it so far in advance. I didn't even look at the time, so I apologize. But uh, our presenter today will be Mr. Frank Greenland. And whenever you're ready, you can come up. Okay, I am ready. Will we get a slideshow as well? You will have a slideshow. What I'm uh, gonna do, and this is a pretty long presentation, Okay. And I'm going to go through the history of it. it we call it Sewer University. So I will cover uh, the history of sewers, how they came to be in, in Northeast Ohio, and how they've transitioned and some of the problems over time. Then I'm going to focus on once sewers transport sewage to treatment plants, how, what happens. And then I'm going to end with a discussion about stormwater management. The district has a new program. Uh, talk about that and then talk about some of the successes. Uh, of all the work that's been done. Now, we're highly linked with the county on sewer maintenance activities in particular, both on the stormwater side and the sanitary mm -hmm. side. So we're always working closely with your folks. I want to keep this as informal as possible. I'm going to fly because it is a long presentation. But I want you to stop me if you have questions along the way. So this is where we're coming from in Northeast Ohio. And if you're a native Clevelander, um, you may remember some of these fires. This is 1952 <coughs> Cuyahoga River fire. This is one of the worst uh, in this area. This is the Cuyahoga River in the 60s, not a good situation. Hmm. This is before EPA was, was formed, before there was a Clean Water Act. This is the 69 fire, which is the most notable and actually garnered some national attention in three years after. It was the smallest fire. So it was fairly inconsequential, but it moved an environmental movement that ultimately led to the creation of the Clean Water Act in 1972. It's important to know Cuyahoga River burned 13 times. This is the most famous. So I'm gonna talk about these items, just about who the sewer district is and our responsibilities, how water cycles through this region. We'll talk a little bit about sewer systems and how they've evolved and the problems that they face. Talk about once we get it there, how, does waste, how do wastewater treatment plants clean up that water? And then I'll talk about stormwater management and some of the issues and challenges we have. So first about the responsibilities. The sewer district was created in 1972 by a court order. We are a regional authority under Ohio 6119. And we service all our parts of 62 communities, about a million people send wastewater to our three treatment plants. So we treat a lot of wastewater annually, over 90 billion gallons of three plants. We own the big pipes. We call them interceptors or the highways of sewage. All the local communities own, operate, maintain their local storm, sanitary or combined sewers, and you maintain a lot of those sewers for communities. And there is a 420 mile, re what we call a regional stormwater network. It's mostly open streams, some are culverted and closed. And we'll talk about that later in the presentation. So in terms of our key responsibilities, when we were formed by court order, these are the four key responsibilities we took on. We own, operate, maintain, upgrade the three largest treatment plants in the greater Cleveland area, easterly, southerly, and westerly. Again, the interceptors are ours, over 300 miles. We took on a mandate to control what's called combined sewer overflows. We have a $3 billion program going forward to reduce those discharges to our streams and to the lake. I'll talk about that a little bit. And we had a mandate to solve inter-community regional stormwater problems, flooding, erosion, and water quality along the stream network. And we'll touch on that as well. These are the three treatment plants. Easterly on the left uh, is at East 140th and Lakeshore. 
services the east side of Cleveland and those suburban, eastern suburban communities. Southerly is our largest plant. Over half a million people discharged of that plant. It's down on uh, East 49th, Grant area, Canal Road area in the valley. Westerly is the smallest one. It's adjacent to Edgewater State Park. That's on the right. This is our service area. It's big, 355 square miles. We don't service all of Cuyahoga County communities, so the Lakewoods, North Olmstead, West Lake, the West Shore communities are out of our service area because they have their own treatment plants. Same thing with Euclid, portions of Strongsville, Bedford, Bedford Heights, Solon, but we, we have all our parts of 62 communities. The color coding here are the types of sewers, and in yellowish are the older urban core areas that are serviced by what's called a combined sewer which means there's one pipe in the street and it combines wastewater from your houses with stormwater runoff from the streets and rooftops. The tan or brown areas are served by what's called separate sewer systems. So there's two sewers, one to collect sanitary sewage, the second one to collect stormwater. And those are the newer sewer designs. And as we move forward with new construction, they'll always be separate sewers. Since 72, and I really think the number is approaching over five billion now, of investment by the Regional Sewer District on environmental enhancements. So we focused on upgrading wastewater treatment plants beginning in 1972. We've constructed several hundred miles of interceptor sewers, primarily to alleviate basement flooding problems in many suburban communities and also the city of Cleveland. I'm going to talk a little bit about combined sewer overflow control. We've done a lot to reduce the discharge of overflow to our area waterways and a number of other upgrades have been performed. So I want to spend just a one slide, I think, on how water cycles through this region. We pull the vast majority of folks in Cuyahoga County and across this area get their drinking water supplies supplied by the city of Cleveland's division of water. So we're pulling water out of Lake Erie, cleaning it, sending it to the users. You use it, you flush your toilets, you wash dishes, you do what you do. So it's Cleveland division of water that's supplying that water. Once it's used and discharged to a sewer system, it's us, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, that cleans that water up at our treatment plants prior to discharging either to the Cuyahoga River, southerly discharges to the Cuyahoga, easterly, westerly to Lake Erie. So that's how water cycles through this region. Now we have another dynamic of stormwater. When it rains, stormwater falls on the land surface and causes a lot of problems. And stormwater, once it washes off the land surface, is not pure. So it too has a pollution water quality impact and certainly flooding and erosion. You read the news every time we get a big rain, somebody's flooding somewhere. So I'm going to dive into the sewer system side first and how things evolved here. And really, before there were sewers, this is what folks did in Northeast Ohio, across the nation, across the world, is collect waste in their houses and dump it out. <laughs> and it was either to the front, into the street, to the backyard, wherever. Uh, and it's kind of amazing to think that people would do that, but that's what happened. And when that happens, obviously, there's a public health threat. And as the area urbanized and grew and more people uh, in this community, more issues. So, you know, in really ingenious creations like the outhouse was another way, way back, where you weren't dumping it in the street, you were going into the outhouse, but the outhouse has limitations too. And eventually they get used, filled, and you got to do something else. So obviously this is not modern technology. So what happened in this region in the 1800s is the first problem is as we've started to build out the area, we got a lot more pavement and buildings and we were generating more stormwater on the streets. So those streets were a mess and they were flooding. So we built storm sewers first to get that public health threat away from us. And at the same time, Mr. Crapper invented the crapper, right? So now you have water coming to your house from Cleveland Water, which means there's more water available to you. And now you're flushing toilets and doing things with that water, so you're generating more wastewater. So this invention, 
the flush toilet, started to aggravate the public health threat caused by wastewater getting either dumped onto the streets or into the backyard. So what occurred in the latter part of the 1800s is we started to tie industry and homes to those initial storm sewers that were built. And so we got the sanitary waste off the street or out of the backyard, but we transported that water, waste mix, stormwater and wastewater, still went out. There were no treatment plants back then. So they figured, you know, certainly the Cuyahoga River can take it or Lake Erie can take it. That's a, the best solution. So untreated wastewater went directly to either Lake Erie or the Cuyahoga River. Throughout this time period, late 1800s into the early 1900s, we started to build what was called interceptor sewers. And they were, we just started to build the system out and we wanted to intercept this waste, transport it to the lake. Uh, and it was designed really to prevent urban flooding and, the, and to prevent or reduce public health risk. But again, waste was still going out into the street, and I mean, into the lake until about early 1900s, 1920s maybe, where initially, and I'll show you a graphic, initially we built interceptors, the network grew, the green lines show the initial interceptors that were built, and again, we're taking the waste right to the river, to the lake. The terminus where the out, we call it an outfall, where that pipe hits the water body is coincidentally the site of the three treatment plants we now own and operate. So that pretty much set the tone for where those treatment plants would be. Gravity is good. And so gravity was taking the flow to those locations. So again, interceptors are our responsibilities. They're the highways of the sewer system. We deal with them. Local communities have their own sewers. So into the 20s, into the 30s, we realized waste on the street isn't good, so we moved it around to the water body. Waste in the water body wasn't good, so things like fish kills and algae blooms were a likely outcome at that time. They realized there was a public health threat, particularly for recreation. You're discharging untreated waste to the lake and you want to go swimming, that's a problem. So treatment plants were built in this area, easterly, westerly, and southerly at the end of those outfall locations. Northeast Ohio, I would say nationally, was probably ahead of the curve on the construction of treatment plants. There were some areas of the country, particularly on the coasts, where there are oceans, where treatment plants, to the sophistication we have, really didn't happen until the 50s and 60s. So there are several types of sewer systems. The first is a combined sewer system, and this is just a quick graphic of what that looks like. And again, when it rains, stormwater runoff comes off the streets and off your rooftops and your flushing toilets. That flow is combined in one pipe. And at some point in the early, let's just say early 1900s and throughout, I would bet until the 50s or 60s, regulator devices were built in the sewer system as we built out, these pipes became overloaded. So we had street flooding or basement flooding. So they built these regulating devices, and I have pictures, to allow some of that wet weather flow to overflow to the environment. And it was really done to keep it out of the basements, which realistically is not a bad move at that point. But still, now you're sending untreated waste to the receiving water. So in dry weather, the flows in these combined sewers are very low. These sewers were built by hand. Most of them are egg-shaped brick sewers, which are pretty cool, and they're still in fairly decent shape in some locations. So flows are low, but when it rains, the flows rise in that sewer system fairly dramatically and very quickly. And so the, there are things like overflow pipes to the right, what we call side spill weirs, a wall. is set at a predetermined height, and it's really pretty much set to prevent either basement or street flooding from occurring keep the sewer levels down. And so that <coughs> overflow is called a combined sewer overflow. And that's, that's a mixture of stormwater and untreated wastewater that goes to every urban stream in the, our service area and to Lake Erie. Different arrangements. Sometimes the flow is twisted perpendicularly. To the right is called a leaping weir. It's probably the most problematic. That's a hole. What you're seeing is the sanitary sewer in that cut and that rectangle below a storm sewer, be, below the combined sewer. So in dry weather, the flow drops into that slot. When it rains, it leaps that hole 
and goes straight out to the environment. There are four to 500 of these devices in our system. And when it rains, these regulators activate. This is a photo of an com actual combined sewer overflow. This is at Mill Creek Falls, Warner Road area. Looks very picturesque, but that flow coming out of the flap gate is combined sewage. And a lot of combined sewage. This, I think, was over 150 million gallons a year coming out of that pipe. Now, the good news is the district has proceeded with improvements in Mill Creek. This overflow has been eliminated. It's gone. You physically can't see it. Metro Parks constructed an observation tower across. So that's a real good sign of success and a big environmental enhancement for Mill Creek. This graphic shows the locations of combined sewer overflows, where they discharge to the stream. The red circles are where they come out to the water body. And the only thing I want to point out is every urban stream in our service area has at least one overflow. Some of the streams have multiple overflows. So the Cuyahoga, Donebrook, Big Creek, Euclid Creek, have Mill Creek have, have multiple discharges where overflows can come out. And you can see a very healthy concentration of overflows along the lakefront from this area all the way out, both east and west of here. When it rains, so what problems do this come, what we call CSOs, combined sewer overflows, cause? The primary cause is because there's wastewater in that stream for what you flush down the toilet. And really, I mean, it's an urban environment. So when the street gets washed off, dogs, animals, birds, they contribute bacteria as well. It gets washed in the system, it can overflow. So bacteria levels at local beaches and in area streams rise following any wet weather event and can stay elevated for a couple days, two to three days. So that's a recreational use problem. And we monitor our beaches at Edgewater, Euclid and Villa daily during the recreation season and post advisories. We do this online. In critical events, we'll actually post signs at the beach. We work with our partners at the Metro Parks. They are the ones that need, they're the beach managers. We provide them the data on whether or not bacteria levels are above or below the standards and they post the beaches. The second problem of combined sewer overflows, we call these floatables. So anything that washes off the street or you flush down your toilet and can float, can get out, and I'm not going to point out the substances in this photo, but it's, you know, some highly objectionable material at times can overflow to the environment. This is more of an aesthetic problem, but along the lakefront and in certain areas along some of the bigger streams, this stuff gets trapped, and it's obviously an aesthetic nuisance. We've done a lot at the sewer districts in 72 to reduce this problem. And we have a big combined sewer overflow, combined sewer system on a national basis. So back in the 70s, we were estimating 9 billion gallons, 9 billion gallons of discharge annually. Currently, we've cut that total to about four and a half. I think the total is really about four now. So we've more than cut this total in half. We've got a long way to go. We're under a consent decree with the federal government to cut this discharge to less than half a billion. And that's still a lot, but that's a $3 billion investment to get to that level. And we, through our studies, feel that that is the real break point from a cost benefit standpoint on protecting water quality and human health through our program. I don't want to get too much into this, but the, the, these are the, this pie just shows you the types of investments we're going to make. The primary investment is in what we call tunnel storage. We're constructing tunnels under the ground. So instead of allowing those overflows to, to discharge straight to the water body, they are dropped down into the tunnel. The tunnel holds them. It's like a swimming pool. It holds that flow. And then after the rain event, all of that flow goes to one of our three treatment plants for full treatment. So this is a major environmental enhancement, particularly for the smaller streams in this area. We're building one, two, three, four, five, six, I think seven tunnels. Uh, starting on the east side, we want to be protective of Euclid Beach and Villa Angela. So the Euclid Creek Tunnel is, is finished and awaiting. We're going to turn it on at some point, hopefully later this year. The Dugway Tunnel, which runs right past, you know, it, it's a, an extension, 
is now under construction as is Doan Valley. So we're really moving forward over the course of the next 25 years or actually the next 15, we'll be constructing tunnel storage to control overflows. This is the route of the Euclid Creek Tunnel. It was done on time under budget, which is good. It's a 24 foot diameter tunnel. So that gives you some idea of the scale of these things. So every time it rains, we can hold 60 million gallons of combined sewer overflow in that tunnel. This is what the tunnel boring machine, so this really kind of drives it home. It's an individual standing in front of that tunnel boring machine. This is the actual cutter head that drilled the tunnel, three miles of tunnel between 100 and 200 feet underground. So these are enormous infrastructure projects. This is what it looks like inside. 24 foot diameter stores a heck of a lot of water. So these are pretty much engineering marvels, but they do a great job at reducing frequency and volume of overflow. There is a green infrastructure component where we're trying to manage stormwater at the surface through what we call green infrastructure technologies. This one happens to be at the courtyard by Marriott, University Circle, pervious pavers, underground detention, and a bunch of sand under this property allowed us to infiltrate stormwater into the sand instead of sending it to a combined sewer system. We took advantage of that, partnered with the Marriott, and it's a very effective project. So there's no stormwater coming off this site through a 100-year storm event, which is pretty amazing. Okay, that's combined sewers. Separate sewer systems were the next sewers that were built in Northeast Ohio. And again, separate, there's two sewers, a storm sewer for the wet weather flow, a sanitary sewer to get flow from homes and industry. This area is fairly unique in the nation. When we transferred from combined sewers to separate, for whatever reason, we built them in a common trench. Dug only one trench, but put two pipes. Some of that might have been cost savings. Some of it might have been because there's a lot of rock near the surface. And it's at that time, very difficult to hand mine two trenches in rock. I don't really know. But these are the arrangements in common trench. And whenever you put two pipes in the same trench, you're going to transfer water between them. And that's what's going on with these. So we have separate manholes. We've got what's called a dividing wall manhole in the middle. That's just like a combined sewer overflow. Water can flow from sanitary to storm or back again. And the over-under system, I have a, a picture. There's a plate. The storm sewer is high, the bigger pipe, sanitary below with a plate in the middle. And this is what the plate looks like. And these are in a number of locations. These are very problematic because the plate weighs 70 to 100 pounds. And when you take the plate off for maintenance purposes, it's heavy. And either you don't want to pick it up again and put it back on, or the pressure of water during a big rain event will physically lift it. And when that plate is missing or dislodged, you can pour a lot of storm water from the storm sewer into the sanitary, and that's how basements start flooding. Mm -hmm. Now, there was this, the next wave of evolution of separate sewers. We got them out of the common trench and started to do what we do today, which is build two sewers in separate trenches. Smaller sanitary in one trench, maybe the other side of the street is the storm sewer. They, too, have problems. Even our separate sewers are approaching 100 years old in certain areas. Uh, and 100-year-old pipes tend to have cracks and leaks. Some you know about, some you don't. Half of the sewer systems on your property, and I don't think people really realize that, that really if you, I would say 40 to 50% of the miles of pipe of a sanitary sewer system are on private property. And the issue with that is how many of you have checked your lateral for cracks or leaks? Nobody. If your house is old, I can assure you there's cracks and leaks. Now, no one does it until their basement starts backing up. So that's a problem, and it's a very tough uh, political problem of should we put public money onto private property to minimize extraneous water in the system and start to tackle basement flooding? I would say if we don't, we're not going to solve that problem. So it's a very, it's a tough one. There's things called illicit connections, houses tied directly to storm sewers, and you say, how can this happen? Well, there's thousands of them out there, and we've been very diligent at looking for these because we find them because 
the stream turns all different colors of the rainbow. And so we back up with our field crews to figure out what's going on. These connections should be tied to sanitary sewers. And so we're always going to be working on getting that correction. But this is essentially you're flushing your toilet 24-7 to the river. So this is obviously a very acute problem, and we've got to continue to get on this. Um, there are also, because the system's old, they take on a lot of water. So some communities have constructed overflows, very similar to combined sewer overflows, to allow some of that sanitary water to get out of the system to keep the basements dry. So there's a number of sanitary overflows. Those are the responsibility of the local communities. So these are the photos of what happens when sanitary sewers and overflows occur. It can come out of the manhole, come out of the street. It could be in your basement. We're doing a lot of work to the lower right is smoke testing. You were looking for where are the big cracks and leaks in the system and getting those things patched up so we don't take on a lot of storm water. Infiltration and inflow is the technical term. It can come from anywhere. Your downspot on your house is supposed to be connected to the storm sewer. Sometimes it's not. That can pour a lot of water off a rooftop into a very small sanitary sewer. And as your line comes across the lawn, there could be cracks and leaks that allow more water. Or in the street, the catch basins are supposed to be tied to the storm sewer. Sometimes they're not. They're tied to the sanitary. So this is how we take on water in sanitary sewer systems. And when we take on water, basements flood. And this is a fairly prevalent problem across our region. So inflow is more concentrated. You're really going to see it. There's a pipe or a downspout connected. Infiltration is a little more insidious. It's a lot of cracks, but if you've got a ton of cracks, across an entire system, it's going to pour a lot of water in. So this is a very expensive proposition to minimize this problem. So those are the three types. That's how sewers evolved in our service area, from combined to common trends to separate. This is a graphic. It's a little busy. It shows the general distribution of these sewers. And all I'll say about this, the tan areas in the middle are the combined sewer areas. So that's where the first sewers were laid. When you move out um, to the inner ring suburbs, now you start to see common trench sewers. Those are in blue. And this is really how the area built out anyway. So that second wave of, of out migration, I guess, were common trench systems. And then we get out to the suburban areas. We still have some septic shown in purple or lilac, lavender. But the um, separate trench areas are shown in orange and green. Some of the separate trench areas take on a lot of water. Those are the ones in orange. Some are pretty tight. Most of them are probably relatively newer. But this just gives you an idea across our service area how things pan out. And again, I want to really drive this point home, and, and you're very involved in this. We own 330 miles of interceptor highways. The communities have 10 times that, and that's just the count of sanitary and sanitary or combined sewers along most of the streets in the community. It doesn't include the private sewer pipe that connects to the main sewer and runs to your house, so you could almost double that total. And this doesn't include storm sewers that are also responsibility of the local system. So in terms of health problems and, and water quality problems, both the sewer district has major responsibility for the treatment plants and the combined sewer overflows, but local communities bear a lot of responsibility too in terms of septic tanks, sanitary sewer overflows, and illicit connections. We put together a program, it just started last year. In our five-year rate picture from 2016 to 2021, we have these amounts available to our member communities, competitive grant program, to start to tackle these problems on the local level. And it is highly competitive. Uh, we awarded, I think, 12 projects last year. They were all great projects, a lot of septic tank removals, a lot of projects to deal with overflows or illicit discharges, so it's all good. The call out for 2018 projects just went out, so we'll start scoring those a little later this year. We intend to up this total 
through the five-year. These are what the board authorized in our five-year rate package. And following 2021, we'll see where we go. But this is really, I hate to call it, you know, $5 million and $12 million is not a drop in the bucket, but on the, the overall, it's, it's, it's not nearly what's necessary, but at least it spurs some rehabilitation in our local communities. Can you tell us uh, which cities um, was impacted in Cuyahoga County? Oh, boy, this is, let's see, who got the awards? I, I'm just going to rattle, but I'm going to miss a few. Okay. I know Newburgh Heights got a project. Parma got actually two projects. Uh, let me think. Let me think. Now you're... <laughs> I, th I think yeah, you can, she'll pull it up for you. Uh, I think almost all the awards were in Cuyahoga County. We might have had one Summit County Award because they are member community. But of the 12, I'm guessing at least 11 were in um, Cuyahoga County. City of Cleveland, I know Olmstead Township got one. There's some septic jobs going out there. Olmstead <laughs> Falls has a major septic <coughs> removal. Seven Hills was a very big project. And these are all great projects. We got a, to get rid of septic tanks is, is, is hard, <laughs> to be honest with you. And this really offsets because they're assessing their residents. And so these grants can help offset those assessments and start to move projects faster. So that's an example of some of the communities. There's a few others. Hmm. Okay. So that's it about sewers. That was quick. I'm going to go very quickly on once we get that, collect that sewage and get it to a treatment plant, what happens? This is a photo of the initial construction at Easterly, I believe, um, which is on the east side. Again, these are the three treatment plants. These were constructed in the 20s into the 30s. There were rudimentary plants in the teens, like 1915 and 1918. Not nearly what you see today, but they started at that time frame. I told you about 90 billion gallons treated annually. That's a big number. And it includes sewage and stormwater. Southerly treats the most because it's the largest service area, and over half a million people discharge there. Westerly is our smallest plant. It's really primarily just serving the west side of Cleveland. And Easterly has a pretty appreciable area, so it's in second place. These are the processes. Once you bring wastewater to a plant, this is how you clean it up. There's a wet stream process where we're removing pollutants. As we remove pollutants, we create what we call a solid stream process. Solids drop to the bottom of tanks, and you have to remove them. And at the end of the show, you've got to disinfect this effluent to take care of any residual bacteria. Very busy graphic. The only thing I want to point out here is there's a blue stream. You can see blue arrows. That's the wet stream. So we're sending liquid through a bunch of tanks to stepwise reduce pollutants. And as we take that flow through a number of tanks, the pinkish or purplish bars are where solids drop out. And solids removal and processing is very expensive. We use incineration, um, fluidized bed incinerators at our southerly plant. It's very expensive. Landfilling solids is incredibly expensive. So we've chosen incineration to reduce the amount uh, and they're very sophisticated plants, but both streams are important. This is what preliminary treatment looks like. The flow that comes in, need, you need to screen off the nasty stuff that could plug pipes and pumps and damage facilities. So the real coarse stuff. In this case, you see rags. This is what comes off these bar screens. So there are a series of bars. The flow is going through the bars. You're screening out big stuff that could cause problems in your plant, and we do discharge or send this to landfill. What do you it, send to landfill? I'm sorry. We will send, this is like grit. There's two things in preliminaries, grit and screenings. These are the screenings. So it's a bunch of junk. It can be leaves in the fall. It's primarily rags and things people shouldn't be sending down. And you're washing off the streets, so it could be timber and leaves and junk like that. It's things that could be floatable someday, too. So these are the screenings. They go to landfill. This is grit. These are aerated grit tanks. You see one of them's empty. So we're sending water through the, the ones that have liquid in them, and there's air 
because you're trying to clean that grit because you want to dispose of cleaner grit at landfills because there's junk on it. So you aerate it. The grit is heavy. It'll settle the empty tank. The only reason I show it is you can see the conveyor system at the bottom. Grit will settle to the bottom. Those conveyors continuously run, moves the solids. It's collected in a barrel or a hopper, and off it goes to landfill as well. And this is what grit looks like. It looks like coffee grounds. A lot of it is. Stones and th just coarse things that either you've sent down your sink or toilet or off the streets. Highly abrasive. If we don't get rid of it, it'll mess up piping and pumps. So that's preliminary treatment. The next step is primary treatment. And all you're doing in primary treatment is slowing the flow down. So these are like swimming pools. And the water flows very slowly for hours, four to eight hours or more. So the velocities are slow. And the stuff that will settle out settles out in these tanks. That flow then goes to what we call secondary treatment. So we're getting rid of solids in primary. We're really attacking the other pollutants in secondary. We have bugs called activated sludge. These microorganisms feed on pollution, organic pollution primarily. They use it as food. So we're allowing the bugs to chew on the pollutants, remove them. A certain amount of bugs will die and they settle to the bottom and we continue to recirculate to maintain a healthy population. We slow it down again to get rid of any residual solids. Then it goes to disinfection at the back end of the plant. There is still bacteria in the water stream. We need to protect the recreational uses of the Cuyahoga and Lake Erie. So we inject sodium hypochlorite bleach into this flow stream to kill off E. coli is what it's doing. And there is a chemical at the end to get rid of any residual chlorine because that can be toxic to fish and, and the aquatic community. We handle a lot of solids. We pull them off of the bottoms of tanks all over the plant. We use fluidized bed incinerators to dramatically reduce. I mean, you can imagine a million people flushing their toilets to treatment plants uh, cause a lot of solids to be dropped out. So this is how we deal with it. We have a state-of-the-art facility that just went online. It's a renewable energy facility, so some of the off-gases are being used to drive turbines and create electricity for our facility. So now I'm going to close. That's it with treatment plants. I just want to close with the bottom, the end of this, which is more stormwater and success. The watersheds of our region, like the Mill Creek watershed or the Big Creek watershed, the watershed is just that area of land that drains to a stream. So it's based on topography, gravity. It's when a rain, raindrops fall on the land surface, where do they eventually travel to? So we have a number of watersheds in this area. The major ones, Rocky River in pink to the left, the Cuyahoga in blue in the center, uh, Lake Erie Tribs, I guess that's a, that's a light pink. So these are the Doan Brooks, Dugway Brooks, Euclid Creeks of the world, and then portions of the Chagrin. These are the major watersheds in the sewer district service area. There's a lot of smaller sub-watersheds, so you might live along Big Creek, that's a sub-watershed, or Mill Creek, or Euclid Creek. So there's a number of sub-watersheds that feed the larger ones. The district, one of its mandates was to solve intercommunity storm drainage problems along these streams. To do that, we, we determined, we, we created what we call a regional stormwater system, and it's very much similar to the interceptors. It's the larger components of how we route storm water through this area. So the blue lines are streams. They comprise what we call the regional stormwater system. The district does not own that system. Property owners own the system. But we have a distinct responsibility to maintain and upgrade and solve problems along those streams, flooding, erosion, and water quality. These are the three major drivers of the program. There was a mandate in our original 6119 charter. This thing went to our board in the, the program. I have personally been working on the program since 96. So a new fee across 62 communities is a very difficult pill to swallow. And it, it took that long of a public discussion to at least get to the board in 2010. They adopted it then. 
This is the equation. This is why stormwater management is more important now than ever. So this graphic is the impervious surface coverage of our service area, the darker areas meaning impervious surfaces, so roads, rooftops, houses, parking lots, shopping malls, the works. If you took this photo in the 1930s or 40s, it wouldn't look like this. So we've really built a lot of hard surface, and when you create hard surface, you create more stormwater runoff and less infiltration into the ground. This is really the equation. If, if you've got a lot of grassed areas or forested areas and it rains, you're going to have runoff, but a lot of it is going to sink into the grass or forested areas. So you see a lot of what we would call infiltration, either shallow or deep. And the runoff component, that component of the rainfall that just <coughs> runs across the lawn, happens, but it's fairly minor. When you put hard surface on, you really prevent the infiltration component. So instead of 50%, you're down to five, uh, 10 or 15% going down into the surface and not creating problems. But that runoff component is dramatically increased. So you see more volume of flow, higher peak, what we call peak rates of flow, because it's flying across pavement. The streams in our service area weren't sized for the, the amount of runoff getting to them today. So what they've done is reshape themselves, resize themselves, which causes massive erosion in certain areas and a lot of flooding because they just weren't sized to take that amount of water. So this is what you see. Stream bank erosion is fairly rampant. All streams are going to erode naturally. The problem is we have accelerated stream erosion near structures whether they're roads, bridges, condominiums, what have you. So these are threats to infrastructure across our service area. You see flooding. This is truly an inner community problem. This is Abram Creek. It's a Sheldon Road right off the border of Middleburg Heights, Brook Park. This isn't Middleburg Heights' problem or Brook Park's problem alone. A number of communities are contributing flow. The problem manifests itself at Sheldon Road. So it's truly a regional issue, and that's really what this program is about, solving regional problems. This is a good one. This was on Warner Road. This is back in, I think, 2013-ish. Uh, We've been watching Mill Creek, and that hillside had been eroding steadily over the years. We'd watched it since, I believe, two, 2005 or six. We had one big rain, and we lost that whole chunk. Uh, of the hillside along Mill Creek, and now we're pretty close to Warner Road. And there were actually, you, you can't, it's hard to see them, but there are cracks just off the pavement in the grass. The next big rain event, we might lose Warner Road. So this is an acute example of what can happen quickly. We did an emergency repair to stabilize this, and things have been good ever since. These streams, so maintenance is a problem along streams. There's a lot of trash racks in our streams. Somebody put a trash rack up for whatever purpose uh, back in the day. Trash racks are great if you collect the trash after the trash collects on the rack. But if you don't remove stuff, what you see here is a classic example. A lot of timber, it serves as like a beaver dam. You get a big rain, the water rushes around the corners. You can see it eroding. The sides, the head walls going in, you're going to lose the trash rack pretty soon. So a big component of our program is to maintain these structures. This is kind of an amusing one. This is the, I call it the washer-dryer solution to erosion control. This is along, I believe, Stickney Creek. It's either in Cleveland or Brook Brooklyn. This is a property owner's attempt at saving his or her property stacking washing machines along the banks, but you can see they're failing. You can see the erosion behind them, and all it's going to take is a big rain event with high flow in Stickney Creek, and now you're going to have that square peg, and it's going to travel downstream to a round hole, culvert pipe or something, and plug it. So we've got to do a lot better than that. Another one, this is the guardrail tire 55-gallon drum solution. Again, we have to do a lot better than this. These are the four major components of our program. We are conducting master planning, regional stormwater master planning by watershed area. We have four master plans slated. Three are now, three are about to be underway. Two are underway. 
The rock, that's the Cuyahoga North and South study, are, they're underway. These are five to eight million dollar efforts designed to figure out why these problems occur and what's the best solution. So the master planning component's underway. We have inspection and maintenance contracts. We have maintenance contractors available to us to pull debris. We have internal inspectors looking for problems on a routine basis. We are designing and constructing projects to solve erosion and flooding and water quality issues. The whole program is geared at encouraging good practices, not only for our work, but to reward our customers that are doing things to improve, to reduce stormwater quantity or improve stormwater quality. We offer credits off of our fees. Again, I, I just talked about this. The blue area is the Cuyahoga North and South. That's underway. The Rocky River, we're going to go to the board, board of Trustees in July to award a contract. That'll be underway. And the final one is up along the Lake Erie Tribs and over in the Chagrin. Sometime in 2018, that'll be underway. And finally, the region will have a detailed plan uh, that, that answers the questions, why are these problems occurring between communities and what's our solution? So we will prioritize our program going forward. Just a quick example of maintenance. This is what a culvert looks like unmaintained. So we'll have an inspector, and obviously one of our inspectors went to this site. Um, what we need to do is pull debris. So we, we see this, we issue a work order to a contractor, we clean it out the next day. So that's been great. We have design and construction projects going on. So the, the, the important thing here is stormwater problems manifest themselves across this service area. It's not an inner ring Cleveland problem, it's everywhere. And we've turned the colors of our, <laughs> our projects. Last year they were all blue and red, which means we were in procurement phase for design or just in design. This year we're starting to see the colors change to green and yellow, which means we're either actively constructing improvements to solve problems or we finish construction. So we will have a series of projects every year that we nominate and conduct design and construction to actually start solving problems. We want to encourage good practices as we go. Again, we have credits. There's green infrastructure. There's things homeowners can do and large industry can do to reduce stormwater quantity or improve quality. So we reward them by putting a, by giving them credits off their fee. Uh, there's a lot of credits that have been applied to date. Now we're over 3,000 credits. Now that's really only 1% of our customer base, 1 to 2%. Uh, you can't make people submit things for credits, but at least we've gotten some response. Um, in terms of the, there was litigation around this. First in common police court, the district prevailing overturned in the 8th district court, and then the district prevailed in Supreme Court at the end of 20, uh, I think that was 14 or 15. 14 was the hearing, 15 was the ruling. So we restarted our program in 2016 and now we're rolling. So real quickly to wrap this up, where we were a long time ago is this river was burning. Significant improvement in Greater Cleveland. I really think the Cuyahoga River is a national success story in terms of its rebound. There are still issues. We do a lot across the community to monitor the health of these streams. We do water chemistry, fish analysis. We're looking at habitat around streams. We assess through electroshocking and other means what types of fish and how many are in the streams. Tremendous improvement on the Cuyahoga River. We're seeing walleye in the river for the first time, which is significant. We look at the bug community in the bottom of the river. It too is recovering nicely. So we're starting to see things like freshwater mussels, which were never seen in the Cuyahoga River, and they've now shown up again, which is a real testament to investment and success. We see things like steelhead trout to the left. That's at the site of the, the last fire of the Cuyahoga River. That's kind of amazing. Lake trout to the right. So we see some pretty cool things. There are a lot of challenges with water quality on Lake Erie. The most recent, obviously, is harmful algal blooms. Big problem, not as big a problem here, but never say never. Uh, it was a problem in here in the 60s and 70s. There's going to be a big al algal bloom this year. So we'll see. That's a very tough problem to tackle. So that was very quick. That was Sewer University. I'll get you all diplomas if you'd like them. We have them. But um, it was a lot of material in a short period of time, I know. Uh, but I'd be happy 
to take any questions you might have at all. Yeah, I have about five, but I'll open it up to committee members first. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Tuma, Miller, and... Okay. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for being here this afternoon. I certainly uh, uh, I learned, learned a lot um, about this whole uh, process. Um, one question I, I know in some of the communities you guys are working on with respect to uh, eliminating septic tanks from communities. Um, is there any long-term effort at uniformity for, you know, one type of sewer um, system, you know, the dual separate okay. system? Because that appears to be the best, you know, from what I could, from my yeah. studies here this afternoon, yeah. that appears to be the, the best method. Right. And <laughs> I, I, would, I would assume that at some point, that's what everyone would, you know, we'd like to see everybody get to. Is, is that an accurate That's assessment? where I think where we're at is just that. Yeah. Now, you know, we take, there's a uniform standards committee yeah. for sewer design. We're a member of the county, everybody, you know, the, the predominant is separate sewer systems. Combined sewer system construction is banned oh, okay. by it's Ohio banned. EPA. Okay. There okay. may be an exception or two if you're in a combined sewer and you want to replace in kind, it doesn't make a lot of sense to separate if there's no real long-term prognosis that the entire system would be separated because right. you're just recombining. Right. But Ohio EPA will not allow almost 99.9% .9 of the time construction combined sewers. I don't know if there's an absolute prohibition of common trench. I haven't heard that. Mm. But the city engineers are well aware of the pitfalls of common trench systems. Right. And they're just a problem, and we're illuminating more of that problem for them now with some studies we've got going on. So you're just not going to see that. No one's going to construct that plate system again. Right. And even that over-under system with the wall between them, that technically is a sanitary sewer overflow. Sanitary sewer overflows are prohibited by US EPA, so you're not going to get a permit to install for that type of system. So I don't think you're going to see any common trend system. What has to happen is... Those common trench systems systematically have to go because okay. they're a huge water quality problem and they cause basement flow. Yeah, is is the substantial more cost to do the the more you know the dual system, the modern more modern system? Well, you're digging two trenches. Yeah, so yeah. So I yeah. can't, you know, yeah, it's going to be costly, right, right. To dig, but you're talking about long term infrastructure renewal, right? So you have service life. So when it's time, you know, if your basements are flooding, you have to do something. So you have to figure out, you know, certainly cost is a component, but if you can separate so all of your basement flooding, which is providing better service to your residents, and now you've got a commitment of 50 to 100 year service life on pipes, you've gone a long way. So right. I think that cost in the long term, to me, is minimal. Right. Right. I mean, both from, a, um, uh, from an environmental standpoint, and then from a from a practical standpoint too, I haven't been on uh, uh, city council in Parma a number of years. One of the worst things that I ever had to experience was was flooding in basements with right. sanitary coming through, and people's belongings, you know, permanently destroyed. And watching that whole scenario. So, um, from again from an environmental impact right. as well as just um, quality of life issues for communities, um, that'd be something eventually that I'd like to see everybody move towards, you know, right. even if it is a little bit more cost at some point in the long run, it's worth it. So, right. But, and that is yeah. what we're seeing. Yeah. Good. We're okay. Thank you. Councilman Miller. Thank you very much for coming down and, yeah. and for the instruction this afternoon. Uh, at the end of the part about solid waste, they mention about, uh, Ash lagoons, can you explain what that is? Okay, the ash lagoons. What, what happens when we incinerate solids in our fluidized bed incinerators, you'll take a big volume of solids and through burning, high temperature burning, you'll get rid of all the water and a lot of the stuff that's in the solids and what will be left is ash. And so that ash has to be periodically removed. We use the ash lagoons to store that and settle ash over time. And it's, it's on our property. We have three lagoons at Southerly. So those were more or less holding tanks for the ash prior to disposal. Now what's going to happen, hopefully in the future, 
is, and we've been working at this with Ohio EPA for whew, 10 or 20 years. Ash, once in, I mean, solids once incinerated uh, and tested appropriately, typically can be used as a beneficial use product, a byproduct for things like soil, construction, that type of stuff. There is likely a market to use that ash for a what we call beneficial reuse instead of sending it to a landfill. Use it for something that can be used for construction or whatever. And we're right at the cusp, I think, of, of making that happen. The regulations needed to change. We needed permits to do that. Now we need people to be interested in it. And that we're right at the cusp of that. So the ash lagoons served a purpose for us to store solids for a period of time. I think long term, they're going to go. But we do need to continue to find a place. There's always going to be some ash, and you have to send it somewhere. You have to hold it somewhere. So currently, does the ash settle to the bottom of the lagoon and then it's sent to the landfill? Yeah, I think so. Now, the send to the landfill part, I'm not positive of that. We had actually some, some land availability at Southerly to store the ash, so we had our own landfill. Now, I, I don't want to misspeak uh, on that. But, yeah, the, the ash settles, the lagoon's dry, and then you have to truck that. You dig them out to prepare to store more ash down the road. Uh, my second question is is about tunnel capacity of these huge tunnels. Are, are they are they large enough to uh, handle any rain we get, or or are there rains that uh, were that still can't handle the water and can't can't store it all, and some of it goes untreated? Okay, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. I should have touched on the presentation. So. We did massive studies in the late 90s, early 2000 timeframe. There is a federal combined sewer overflow policy that dictates what all communities need to do to minimize water quality impacts caused by CSOs. So we looked at our system, and what we were looking at were several things. How often do these overflows activate? When they activate, how much comes out? Volume. Once that volume comes out, to the receiving water, what happens in Big Creek or Lake Erie? So we did $50 million of planning to determine that. Now, a lot of the overflows back then and still some today, the worst ones probably go 80 times a year. So we probably have about 120 distinct rain events, some of them really little, some really big. So the worst ones are going almost all the time, up to 80 times. Some of them today go zero, and it's just the lay of the land and the tributary areas. So what we're what we're doing, let's just say the average was 40 to 50. I would say the average system wide was 40 to 50 overflows a year, uh, four and a half billion gallons. The program we have going forward at most locations, we're going to cut the discharge to two, one, or zero at probably 75 to 85 percent of those locations. Maybe even a little more. It might even be up into the 90s. So instead of 80 times a year, we're going to be down to two or less at most locations. Uh, and this was negotiated with EPA. It was predicated on our analysis of the cost benefit of taking those overflows down. So this is a dramatic improvement. What we're saying is when it rains on the combined sewer system, 98% of the water that falls or is in the system is going to be captured for treatment at our treatment plant. So on a national scale, that's huge. That's one of the highest percent captures you're going to see nationwide. But we're on the Great Lakes. And, you know, we shouldn't tolerate sewage, untreated sewage, going to the Great Lakes. So it's not going to capture every one of them. Some we might be able to completely, and we've eliminated some already. There used to be a few more overflows. Some are predicted to go zero times in a typical year. If we get a rain, you know, four or five incher, these things are going to go. And quite honestly, they're emergency outlets to protect public safety, really, at that point. So it's not elimination. We did look at scenarios on what would it take to eliminate. And you take that $3 billion estimate and probably push it to about $8 billion or more. And now we have a problem in terms of, you know, we have a, a significant issue in funding a $3 billion program. We just didn't think it was prudent to do. And through our negotiation with US EPA Ohio and the 
Department of Justice came to an agreement on what the appropriate level of control would be. I have heard a theory put forward that that we could change the target, which you said at 98%, and change it to 97%, which would save us $300 billion, and and that we could... uh, or 300 million, rather. <laughs> and uh, we could take 100 million of that and do a countywide tree planting program, which would uh, collect and, and, and store more water than, uh, mm-hmm. than you would uh, save with the 1% that was not diverted. In, in other words, you'd be uh, just as effective or more effective, and you'd improve the tree canopy, and, and you've, you'd save $200 million. My question is uh, whether, you've, whether you've heard anything like this and whether, whether this, is, this has been discussed. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll be honest. I have heard of it. I've been <coughs> in the discussions, and I, I will carefully choose my words. I will say this, that... Um, Information that comes out is not always correct information. Um, The sewer district was in a long, hard negotiation with the federal government and EPA and came to an agreement on what an appropriate level of control would be. We, as public stewards, are always looking for opportunities to reduce costs for our program through innovative design standards, through different ways of doing things, different technologies. We can't remain static. Now, I'm aware of the proposal on trees, and I will say the sewer district loves trees. We do. We like trees. We think they're an integral part of stormwater management. We do disagree with the portrayal of the numbers and what they might do. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, we save $300 million, but we use $100 million here. You know, is that a wise public investment as well? Where should that money go if there's savings? So we are open and having discussions on that. Our green infrastructure projects incorporate trees to the extent uh, we can. Certainly the stormwater program, we want riparian corridors to protect floodplains and the like. There is some, you know, it's a tough discussion. There's misrepresentation occurring, and, and to plop $100 million in trees doesn't necessarily equate to the level of CSO control that's being portrayed. And it creates another infrastructure. I'm all for trees. But there has been representation about just take it to 97%. Piece of cake, EPA wants you to do it. It's not that easy. But we are having discussions and will continue to have discussions centered around doing the right things to minimize costs for CSO control across this region, and it's a tough debate. When you reduce levels of control, then in some aspects you're saying it's okay to allow raw sewage discharges to go more. And now we have another public policy debate, whether or not it's appropriate to allow overflows to occur more often. And that's a tough one. So it's not, you know, it's easy to say just take it from 98 to 97 and everything's great. It's not that easy. But we are having discussions, and we do intend to continue to look for opportunities. It might be trees in some respect, in some respect. Okay, well, I I just wanted to get some sense of of how much buy-in there there was into that suggestion. uh, Well, you know, the trees, the the big thing with trees is where you put them. Mm -hmm. you got to put them somewhere where they're going to take water off the streets. And when they're in the backyards, they don't necessarily take water off the streets. But again, we like the concept of appropriate use of trees and other vegetation to manage stormwater at the surface. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Baker. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, my question is going to go back to the um, 2011 and 2013, 14, and 15 during the litigation. Um, and I guess the first question I will ask you is, what is the price tag 
of this proposal that was litigated um, at the time. What is the total cost? Of the litigation or of the program the, that the, resulted the, from it? Of the project. Of the program, the project. Okay. The uh, fee, just to put perspective on the fee, is $5.15 for what we call equivalent residential unit, ERU. And an equivalent residential unit is 3,000 square feet of hard surface, pavement, rooftops, and the like. Now, that 3,000 square feet is what's typical of an average residential house. <coughs> we tier houses, small, medium, and large, and the large parcels pay their proportionate share. If they're 10 times that average, they pay 10 times more. Now, there's some breaks on the large properties. Can I ask you, this, uh, before you continue, okay. the 515 per 3,000 square foot for a residential on the, what is that money, and how often do they pay quarterly? Monthly. It's monthly. a monthly fee, so you're looking at $60 and something per year, a little $60 over $60. per year. Yeah, a little over 60 It's 12 times 515 Okay. Um, that generates approximately, I'll use $42 million in revenue. Now, that's if you collect, you know, at 90 plus percent, and that doesn't always happen. Now, of the collected revenue per the per initial district proposal and then fine-tuned in the court proceedings, we have what we call a community cost share account. So 25% of the collected revenue by community is <coughs> held by the district in separate accounts for each community for local stormwater <coughs> projects. And we have a <coughs> policy and procedure on how the program works. It's a grant reimbursement program. You only can use it for certain projects, um, but it's a pretty easy process, and it's it's a mechanism to get local work done as well. So that takes off 25%. This year's budget, my budget for stormwater, was thirty, roughly $34 million. The largest chunk goes to design and construction uh, and the master planning. These are very expensive studies, so most of the Work is in design, construction, and master planning. The maintenance contracts are roughly, let's just say, closing in on $4 million for our maintenance folks, both our inspectors and our contractor crews. Um, so we're divvying, you know, we're just trying to get as much done with that amount of money. So that's kind of the breakdown. The, um, the, what I heard was the most impactful was not the residential, but was the business contribution. Um, and probably, I, I would think that that's higher than 515. Um, and it's, also the square footage of what they own because of their rooftops right. and their parking lots and, right. and all. And that it was thousands of dollars a it can year. Be, for yeah, a large parcel, it can be a significant bill. And again, it's, it's based on that 3,000 square feet. So if your industry or commercial establishment is 100 times that, then it's 100 times 515. Now, built into the agreement, the court proceedings, we have what's called declining block rate. And so as you move up the scale, there are certain breaks. There is some reduction for the larger parcels. And it's kind of predicated on some of the crediting and the way we tier residential. It's more, more towards how we tiered residential. Mm -hmm. So there's a declining block that does cut some of that fee, minimize it. But we had to be fair, equitable, and proportionate on how we charge. Mm -hmm. And we used in our research, there's over 1,000, there's probably 1,400 stormwater utilities nationwide. Um, we're late to the game. We were late to the game. Mm -hmm. But we did a lot of research with national consultants and looked at what utilities did, how they charged. We chose impervious surface alone as because our premise is there's an incremental change to stormwater runoff caused by impervious surface cover. And as such, that's what we're going to use. Like you use your water meter reading to charge for wastewater because there's a good correlation between water usage, wastewater production. So that's that's kind of how we got there. And we need to be careful that we don't treat anyone differently. May I ask, um, on the average for a business that has a typical maybe uh, shopping center, maybe it's a manufacturing company, they have their parking, 
what on the average would you say those businesses were taxed unexpectedly really um, what 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 did they have to um, absorb in and why it led to this litigation because of the cost and I believe that's what the litigation was about it was about the cost wasn't it no the litigation was about there was a cost component there was um, the litigation was about does Ohio 6119 give the district the authority to implement a regional stormwater program and the fee and, and to charge a fee. Mm -hmm. And in some courts, there's um, this is a fee for services provided, not a tax. And so we have oh, you know, the use of the term tax. We it's a service fee for it's a fee for services. And we were very careful in the development of this program to outline the services that would be conducted, research the problems before you assess a fee, and then assess a fee according with the commensurate services you're gonna provide. Um, so the litigation was really tax and fee, mm. had that aspect to it, but it was authority question. Mm. Um, there were certain groups in opposition. Uh, there were certain communities in opposition it was also a preponderance of communities that were not in opposition. So we, you know, we litigated. Um, there were good arguments, uh, and the district prevailed in Supreme Court. So now we have to run a good program. I can't give you an answer no. on what the typical, because there's nothing typical about industry. Some commercial establishments might be three or four or five or six ERUs. So you can, the math, you know, $30 a month. Ford Motor, Arcelor Middle, much larger parcels, the Cleveland Clinic, right. very large parcels. So we work very carefully with those large customers to really hone in on what's impervious surface on your property, but we also work really hard at looking for opportunities for credits for the stormwater management aspects they do today or could do in the future. Uh, if I may just ask, um were there any exceptions for profit or nonprofit? The exceptions, there was a previous court ruling that our municipalities, what's called self-supporting or non-self-supporting properties, were exempt from the wastewater fee, so we carried that. We're not charging public roads. And this was on the advice of our consultant as we were developing the program, so public roads are not charged. Um, hmm. Roads in certain cemeteries are not charged. I'm trying to think of the other exceptions. All right. Uh, so ballast clearly, along railroads are not charged. Hospitals. No, oh, the nonprofits and schools are in the program. They are. And one final for now, the um, time frame. When do you expect that this would be done? When would this program, what is your, I don't know if you had a beginning and end. Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to sound flippant when the rain stops. <laughs> Here's the problem. Here's the problem. The rain's not stopping, and this year is a good, good example of that. We're going to make headway. We're already making headway at identifying what are the biggest causes of the biggest problems, and we're executing design and construction. Maintenance will never end. The trees are never going to stop falling in these streams. People are never going to stop throwing tires and things in streams that cause streams to clog and flood. And the rivers will never fully stop eroding. They'll move in a different fashion. Now, every five years, the, the rate, the fee is frozen uh, on the stormwater program through 2021. So there's no incremental, it's 2021 or 2022, something like that. So there'll be no incremental rise to the fee over the course of the next five years or so. Now, when we get to 2020-ish and we're looking at that next five-year fee increment, we're gonna to have to take a hard look at what have we accomplished, what have we learned, and what is the current situation? Should the fee remain static? Should it go down? Should it come up somewhat? Commensure it with the services we need to provide and the lay of the land at that time. If I may, um, only because of your, your answer, isn't the significant part of what's being feed <laughs> okay. the uh, separation of the sewer? 
And no. isn't that where the money is in, in the tunneling and the separations and the improvements? You know, it, no. it, and this was something that came up in litigation, and I want to, you know, I testify to this on the stand. There was a presumption by some parties that we're going to collect fees and use them for combined sewer overflow control. Absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. There are two accounting streams on the fees we collect. There's a wastewater account that handles wastewater treatment, interceptor sewer, combined sewer overflow control needs, whether they're maintenance people or projects, separate. And a separate sewer service charge mechanism in place. There's a separate accounting function for the stormwater function. Fees we collect go into an account. It's not sewer separation. We're, we're dealing with stream issues, erosion and flooding and water quality issues along stream segments. Now, I, I will admit that sometimes there's that gray area on what's a stream issue and what's a sewer issue. But these, these funds are segregated. You know, we may have a situation, we do have situations where there are sanitary <laughs> sewers in the bottom of streams that are becoming exposed because the streams cut down. Now, that's an infrastructure problem. Now, we'll go to the owner first for them to effect the repair, but if it takes a stream restoration job to do that, we'll use our stormwater program to protect the infrastructure. And so these are separate accounts. and. Um, and they need to be, and we're highly audited on the use of these funds. Uh, and it's my job to make sure that the funds we collect from our residents are used for stormwater purposes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Let the record reflect that Councilwoman Brown's in attendance. <laughs> Councilwoman Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question goes back to, uh, it kind of relates to the fees, and but more so the fee credits. How... Um, how aggressively uh, are we informing the public? Like, what what me measures or means are we marketing to let um, let people know that these uh, credits are available? Okay, we've done a lot. We did a lot of work up front, and we continue to do work. We um, on our website, we've got a pretty robust stormwater site that gets into credit opportunities and has all the paperwork on for residential or for large parcels what you have to do to apply for a credit and the process and procedures around it. I have three watershed team leaders and one or two staff, technical staff, that talk to residents or commercial establishments. We will go out to the locations to look at the lay of the property and give them ideas on what they can do. And a lot of people take us up on that. We've done credit workshops in the communities, a number of those workshops. We just did a round recently and each year we will continue to do so. For the schools, there's an education credit available to them uh, that we um, yearly, because there's renewals that are necessary. So on an annual basis for commercial, industrial, and, and school-based credit programs, there's going to be a mailing or a notification of the credit renewal process. But these workshops are also designed to continue to educate Folks, we have a, we're all over the place at meetings, community meetings. We'll go wherever, whenever to talk about our stormwater program. And we always bring folks that can deal with the credit questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of uh, friends now that we send out stormwater bills. So we get a ton of questions. We have 320,000 accounts. So we get a lot of questions about the bill. Most of them are the residential. And they're always looking for opportunities. So we always, we, we're sending information. We're talking to customers on a routine basis. We were told by our consultants that you can only expect to see a few percent of the folks mm -hmm. apply, but we'd like to get that total up. The good news is this year, I think the, the credits have grown by about a thousand, which is good. So we just have to continue to get that, that word out. So I guess the question for me, um, as we're out in the community, what would what would the I, I'm assuming there might be some investment that needs to take place to to um, to make yourself eligible for the credits, and then what would that translate into savings um, over the course of time? So, can you give me an, an average of those two, the initial investment, and then what you can expect to save? The fee, I can give you my best guess on that. Mm -hmm. The fee. 
Now, some will debate me that the fee is low, but the fee is at five fifteen per month and sixty a year, um, is low enough that if if you're looking for return on investment on the rain barrel, it's going to take a little while. And in rain barrels, sometimes if you if you luck out, they come free at a workshop. Other times. Home Depot or wherever you go, those things can run, let's just say, approximately $100. Mm -hmm. Some are less, some are more. Um, so on a return on investment standpoint, because the fee is so low, it it's not a typically return. a return on investment game. So if you're saving 25, you save 25% for a rain barrel. Okay. And if you're paying 60 a year, what is that, $15? Mm -hmm. So that takes a while mm -hmm. to recoup that. Most people that are doing this have already been doing it or want to do it because they're into sustainability, they're into green infrastructure, they're into doing their part. Now on the larger commercial industrial properties, a lot of the credit folks already had practices in. For the rest, timing is everything. So typically if you're gonna redo a parking lot on a large industrial or commercial property and you're gonna to have to invest in pavement and construction, that's the appropriate time to make a change. And, and we've got a lot of engineering firms that are analyzing potential for credits and, and whether or not that makes sense. But again, we're seeing, you know, when the time's right, I think people will move and, and put in practices to better manage stormwater. It helps in, in terms of flood protection on their own properties. Mm -hmm and you get some money off of the fee. So it's at the right time. There are others, I took a number of calls early. There are corporations that wanna be green and it's very important to them. Mm -hmm. So we work really hard with them and they're not necessarily doing it on a return on investment. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a dollar outlay to construct the practices. What is your return on investment in terms of advertising dollars, in terms of our company's green and sustainable? That's hard to quantify. So it's a little bit of both, but the fee is is not that exorbitant. So it typically doesn't result in a two year turnover on return on investment. So with with, with that being said, um, is the, has there been you talked about engineers, but has there been some consideration of or um, relationships with builders that incorporating these units uh, like the rain belt on into the property from the start, you know, as we're, we're building new homes or right. Um, right. contractors that are renovating properties. Are, are we introducing this idea to say this is um, something we should just be doing just to p make our, our earth uh, more sustainable as we as time goes on? Yeah, and there is some of that. I think a couple things. First, a lot, some communities, the building codes themselves prevented the attainment of a residential credit. For instance, you couldn't disconnect your downspout and run it to a rain barrel, or you couldn't disconnect it and run it to a grassy surfaces. And in some communities, you, they're not going to let you do it, and they may have reasons for that tightness of the lots and mm -hmm. disputes or flooding between neighbors. Uh, but we've worked hard with a number of communities, Cleveland, Parma, there's others who have changed their codes to make it uh, much easier for a residential or a commercial industrial customer to put these practices in place so that they can manage stormwater and recoup some benefit on the fee. So that's good news, and I think that's going to continue. Just like sewer, you know, the Sewer 101, taking waste to the lake was the predominant design principle in the 1800s. Well, things have changed. Same thing's happening on the stormwater side. We're learning, particularly because of the rains and the nature of these rains and the age of the system, you have to manage stormwater regionally and you have to do it locally. If you're ever going to solve this basement flooding problem and solve the problem of these streams getting beaten up, so codes and design practices need to change and they are changing. I think on another <coughs> avenue, pervious pavement, uh, traditional old style engineers are like, no way, it freezes here, we can't do that. But that's not the case, so there's an education process to educate the engineering community, the design community, that new innovative stormwater practices actually do work in their proper application. So I th we're already starting to see 
more of that. And I think you'll see more down the road. And just how we lay out new development, we just have to do a better job, quite honestly. We're not anti-development. We're smart stormwater management during development. Uh, and what we're trying to do is what the region's been great at is moving a problem from one location to the next by not managing stormwater effectively. So my hope is our master plan really takes a hard look at solving today's problems, but also is instrumental in preventing tomorrow's problems from occurring. Because right. then you spend twice. You solve this problem, it moves, you solve, you know, you're spending twice, we have to stop doing that. So it's gonna take a while, but things have already happened on the ordinance level and the acceptance of pervious pavements in some some situations, and mm -hmm. I think you'll see more. And when you say pervious pavements, are you you're speaking of like pavers in the back backyards or patios? Or, or like asphalts, that? there's porous asphalts yeah. and concretes. Yeah. Um, parking lots are a good example. There's a number of demonstration projects across our service area at certain government centers and some uh, communities. We offer what we call a green infrastructure grant mm -hmm. to uh, communities for innovative green infrastructure practices to manage stormwater at the surface. So there's some pretty cool stuff going on across the region and you're seeing more and more of this. It's always a cost benefit equation and it's, it may cost more on the initial outlay but provide more benefit long term. Right. So these are the things, we can't keep doing things the same way. We just can't. And just one last question on that, on the pavement, when, um, so when you're assessing that fee, when you have pervious pavement, then that fee is reduced, it, it is not included. There are some credit, yeah, there's, and I, I don't have the exact details, but okay. there's, it's in our credit manual, there's a reduction on either you get a credit or there's some situations, I think, if you remove pervious areas, for okay. instance. Okay you get the better deal of a 25% credit for a certain amount of removal, or if your tier changes, that might get you the better credit. So we, we make the appropriate adjustment to maximize your benefit. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, Mr. Greenland, we'll go back to page 27. Um, cause most of my questions have been answered, so I have a couple left. To, uh, page 27 where I asked which communities within Cuyahoga County uh, benefited from the the grant okay, process. Could you forward this committee? Uh, well, this, I have the list now. Yeah, but could okay, you, you forward wanna... the um, the committee the additional cities within Cuyahoga County that may not have benefited? May not have benefited. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we can give you the yeah. There were twenty five to twenty seven. Might not know about it. You know, we just want to make sure that everybody knows. In the, in the okay. various cities, about we put out an RFP every year. We just put out our RFP. It goes to the community mayor, city engineer, service director. Typically, Cuyahoga County is aware of it. Summit County is aware of it. Um, we can give you a list of the communities that were in our that are in our service area. All sixty-two that are eligible. We can give you a list of the communities that applied in 2016, and that list is probably 20-ish out of 62. And if you want, we can give you a list of who was awarded projects in 2016. That's, that's not hard to do. So you said City of Cleveland was one of the cities in 2017. 16, in 16. 16. I meant 16. So when or actually 17. It's the when will City of Cleveland be program. eligible again? Is They're all eligible? eligible every year. Every year. It's a competitive grants program, and there's criteria. We have a scoring committee. So every year, everyone's eligible, and we award to the best projects. Gotcha. Uh, second question will be on page 30. When you talked about the incineration of the solids, how does this impact the environment? We have, we are held... When you incinerate solids, um, there's a solid stream. So if there's ever going to be disposal somewhere, whether it's at ash lagoons or off-site, we're held to rigid testing standards for the nature of what's in the chemicals, I mean, in the solids chemically. And depending on what's in any solids, I don't care if it's ash or, or construction debris, 
There are appropriate areas for disposal. We are held to very strict clean air standards for our incinerator stack gases. So there's very rigid testing performed on our incinerator stacks and we have to comply. And we have actually constructed recent improvements to further our ability to remove certain pollutants in the stack gases to comply with Clean Air Act standards. And Clean Air Act standards change from time to time and we're on top of that and, and we routinely test every year to make sure we're in compliance. And who checks your compliance? Who and how often? You talk about that you check your, your, your compliance. Is that the EPA that comes in? Who the EPA delegates, EPA ultimately has primacy on this, but I'd have to talk to our regulatory compliance. I believe the, um, is it the Cleveland Division of Air? I'm not positive, and Darnell, if you could, we'll, 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 we'll have to get back to you. They've dealt, like, we're the pretreatment authority for industry, for EPA, so we're the EPA on monitoring local industry. They have another delegated authority um, that we submit our test results. I know we need annual testing uh, on our incinerator stack, and so we can provide those details to you. Okay, I guess my last question would be, you, state, you stated in your discussion, protect our Great Lakes. So I just was wondering, um, are the neighboring counties going through a similar kind of dugway sewer project along the lakes? All communities that have combined sewers and combined sewer overflows are under this federal combined sewer overflow policy. So not every community, I think there's 750 nationwide. Um, so locally, it's us, Toledo. But I'm just talking about, yeah, Lakewood, Great Lakes. Lakewood and Euclid in close proximity. Lakewood operates its own plant and has overflows. Same thing with Euclid. Both are in, they're not as advanced. Well, Lake Euclid's been doing a lot of stuff. So they Euclid has a consent decree with the federal government. Lakewood's discussing a consent decree and has some interim decree. So our neighbors to the east and west are also in the same uh, a similar situation, their systems are just a lot smaller. Because water touches and flows everywhere, so. You are correct. Yeah. So we're, if they're That's not right. cleaning up their problem. What about Michigan, with the issues with Michigan? They're on the Great Lakes. All communities across the okay. nation that have combined sewers. Gotcha. Now the, the question is, what's your level of control? Mm -hmm. And it does vary. I will say the Great Lakes catch a lot of scrutiny, as they should. Now, it does impart, there's a financial obligation. But Michigan, we're under Region 5 of US EPA, which covers Michigan, Ohio, five or six states. They're under the same federal policy. The actual program implementation can vary depending on the community. But they're under the same general guidelines to reduce combined sewer overflows to protect water quality. All right. Any other questions? Just one for me. Councilwoman Brown, then Baker. When you mentioned best pro um, projects for the, uh, the the municipalities <coughs> that are awarded, is matching funds one of those? Okay. Is we have a minimum 25% match. More points if you match more local funds. We recognize financial hardship in, in a couple of our communities so those in fiscal distress we can waive the 25 percent match okay councilwoman baker thank you um just back to what we were um with the five dollars and 15 cent fee mm -hmm. that that is not a zero to 515 you we also what what was the maintenance what do typically residential and commercial pay before this program was put in place for the maintenance and the all that the erosion and all the servicing type things I can't speak to each individual community but on the intercommunity regional scale nothing really and that's why we have the problems we have because we've got each community handles their own internal stormwater problems um, in their own fashion 
And so I cannot tell you how much anyone was paying. I will tell you on a region-wide basis, there was no formalized program for stormwater management. Now, some communities, some contract with the county to maintain storm sewers. <coughs> now, the maintenance of storm sewers is not nearly what this program's about. Our program is much more than that, but maintenance is a key aspect and we fully endorse the work the county's doing. But essentially, there was no intercommunity program, so everyone worked within their borders or did nothing at all. I have been at the district for 29 years and I'm a native Clevelander. I know where these problems have been. I grew up in a neighborhood with problems and those problems are still here. And, because, and the reason they're here is because streams are inner community in nature. So if you've got seven communities contributing flow to that stream and it, the problem is here, why should that community pay for it? And you know how difficult it is to rally the troops to get seven communities to pay for the problem that might be in Cleveland or Parma or wherever it is. It doesn't happen. So that's why a regional authority, that's why we were created in 72, to solve these problems where there's multiple community involvement and they're big problems. So we didn't have a lot of revenue going to stormwater. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, no further questions. I want to thank you, Mr. Greenland. You're welcome, thanks, anytime. It was nice pace. You got to drink your water, and yeah. it, we, we didn't rush you. It was good. I appreciate it. Very your informative. Very nice questions, too. And I I'm, appreciate I'm, it. I know Councilman Miller has probably been out to the water treatment plant I have. So, okay. So We've got an I'm, open house in September. I forget. It just this. amazes me how all that sludge and it ends up like this at the end of the tour. Well, the water you get is good. Yes. You know, believe it or not, Lake Erie's good drinking water source, and the water we send back is good, too. So, <laughs> of I course, I'm highly biased. Eyes, but, you know, yes. <laughs> I'm highly biased. Thank you very much. Thank you very Bye. much. All right. I believe we have no miscellaneous business. Um, first, we have Ms. Liu sign in for public comment. We'll see Ms. Liu. Come on. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, this presentation really is important to me in the way that because it brought me the memory back the last year. And here I have to thank our council member, Conwell, again for her effort. It was the sewage water backed in to Noma her building. Uh, of course, that building was not the only one having that kind of damage. We could not have hot water because the newly installed hot water tank at that time was also damaged. We lost lots of mattresses, and Ms. Conwell made an effort to find the funding as soon as possible to help the people out in the shelter. However, there's another safety issue here, not as less dangerous as today that our water problem. I think all of you may have this uh, grievance in front of you. This is something happened almost every, like I was just say every day, but this time the situation is even worse because EMS call had to be made on two injured staff member. Yes. Uh, this particular staff didn't really do the, uh, her job perfectly, but still, Frontline is the organization hiring people, put them in the shelter to work, but without giving them the proper training. And also Frontline Service is the company, the organization, not hiring specialized staff to work in the shelter full with people with health issues, doesn't matter physical or mental health. So this happened. Uh, to answer uh, Ms. Brown's question, three, uh, about three weeks ago, the first grievance I filed right here, I still haven't got that dinner. <laughs> and that same staff member, guess what she did yesterday? We had a resident having seizures on the floor. She was also out of consciousness for a while, but this staff came in. When the good staff was busy to handle the seizure situation, she said, oh, oh, this seizure? Oh, it's not something left in death. This is the bad worker we have.
just a few of them. Unfortunately, this makes the whole situation very bad every night. This grievance, please read it. If you have any more questions, I will answer you for whatever I actually witness. If that's something I guess, you will see in my words, but this is something actually happened. Please understand, this is a public shelter, so it's a public safety. Not only for the people staying at the shelter, it's also for the people working at the shelter. Thank you. Ms. Lou, may I ask you a question? You, you put in this grievance um, on Friday, May 26th? Yes. Did Incident get, happened in the morning. Did you get a response yet? How long does it usually take for you to get a response, and how do they respond? To this the one, oh, basically, with a frontline service, your grievance is nothing. For no, the just, grievance I, just, I filed I three just, weeks listen, ago, listen. it took more than six days for me to actually talk to a client's right officer. Right now, from whatever I can tell, there's still no resolution to inform me. Okay. So this is the reason why I will file that with you to let you see why frontline services should not be qualified to bid on shelter or any other county contract. Thank you. Thank you. Who's um, next? Last, Ms. Wyvon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councilman Conwell, my county council person in Glenville, and also to all of the other council people. My name is Wyvon. I am an advocate for humanity. We have in our communities uh, properties that are toxic and leaking toxic fluids. I wanted the people from the sewer district to stay to, for my comments because they pertain directly to them. Some of the properties have not been identified or registered with Otter as toxic fields. They are previously privately owned and some of them are into your land banks now. I've talked with the city officials and the mayor had conferences with them. Uh, we actually have an actively leaking gas tank in my community. And I'd like, I see that they put wells in to test these tanks, but it took years to get to that point. So the, when he talked about um, the grants to, for innovative projects to try and remedy some of these issues, I think that it is important that the county bond with the residents that have come forward or that will come forward with projects to help relieve us of some of the lead that's leaking into our, our communities. Our children are playing in these lots. They're walking across them every day. And to divert storm water and to put grass over them is not an adequate remedy for that when there is an active 3,000 gallons of fluid beneath the ground. I think that we need to pay uh, ser serious attention to the fact that we have a lot of poison. And in a community where the Glenville High School has 98 graduates last year and maybe 75 this year, then we're looking at some kind of long-term issue when a 70 plus year old gas station has lain um, fallow and has been leaking for that long, it seems to me where it speaks to the fact that some of those people are being affected by the lead that's in the ground. And I don't know where else to turn to to say that I am a resident that is taking a proactive stance on it, and I'd like the assistance, whatever the county can provide with helping us to remedy this, to remedy it for all communities, because it does affect them. It goes into the watershed when that stuff overflows into there, into the groundwater. It's, oh, it affects our watershed, it affects the aquifers, and it affects our drinking water. They didn't talk about how much lead might still be in your drinking water, but there's quite a bit. We have as much as Flint or more. So in a small way, I'm asking for assistance. I don't know what kind and how, but something has to be done something more than is being done. And which Thank gas, you. which is, which old gas station? It's at uh, 113, and it's between 113th and, 
and um, 114th and Superior on the south side of the street. I have auto registration already. So they registered it under me, but it's actually properties that are, it's, it's a complicated issue because the gas station was there and part of my property sits on top of some of that gas station. So I'm caught in the middle of it. Um, I have an auto registration letter for that tank that I found there that previously someone tried to put a basketball court on top of with children. And I kept saying, if this was a former gas station, we should be checking to make sure that the tanks aren't there. And people kept saying, oh, they're not there. Don't worry about that. And I found the valve a few years ago. And I kept getting, trying to get people out. And nobody came. I finally got the state fire marshal to come out and find it. And at that time, the same time, um, I think it was the sewer district that put the well in to test what is happening there. But we still have a push, a constant push by development corporations to do something with that land without regard to the fact that there's poison there. It's toxic and we need to, to try. And if we're going to do something with it, why not take it and make it a project of the community or the city or the county that says, let's learn something from this project. Let us, let us be innovative enough to teach the levels of taking this project from the disaster that it is to a success story that it could be, using our, our residents and our schools, teaching on that level, make it an across the curriculum type project. That's my plea, that's my wish, I hope, my dream, that we take that project or that parcel and turn it into something that we learn from, how to deal with these kinds of issues and all the nuances of them and teach our, our people so that they can have gainful employment maybe in these fields. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for listening. There's nothing else um, before us, before this committee, so meeting is adjourned.